Good morning. Good morning. It is a beautiful day. It's still summer, and all those who don't enjoy snow and you don't enjoy the 20 below, you should be shouting hallelujah because you don't have to deal with that today. Isn't that exciting? Come on now. You, you can't have it both ways. You can't not like the heat if you don't like the cold, you know, vice versa. So um, I, I was just talking to somebody the other day. I'd rather take 20 below than 100 degrees. I, that's just me. I'm, and that's me. So, uh, yeah, I'm not real thrilled about 100 degrees. But we just live with that and enjoy God's goodness through it all. Amen. Why don't you stand with me as we open with prayer and, and let's give thanks to God for his goodness. Lord, we're thankful that you have blessed us abundantly. Uh, the circumstances around us they do affect us, but they mean little to nothing compared to your grace, your love, your peace, the joy we have in you. And so, Lord, we just thank you for who you are in our lives as you lead and guide, as we celebrate who you are, and as we commit ourselves to you once again from our heart of hearts to follow your word, to follow your decree, to follow your spirit. We just pray your anointing to be upon us all as we celebrate your love and we do this as one great big family. We just give you thanks and give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
storm where you were actually shaking a little bit, where you uh, were just worried about whatever the crisis was. Uh, I know the biggest storm that ever hit the farm when I was a kid was a tornado that went through, and we weren't actually home. And it was probably a good thing because my brother and I loved storms, and we would put our face right up to the window and watch the lightning strike and the wind blow, and we would watch stand out there in the open and watch the hail storms coming with dread because of the crops. And, but the, the day that we weren't there, um, when the tornado hit, the glass from that window went through a family room, 40 some feet of space and into another room through a little picture window that was open for serving because we did some remodeling. And I c couldn't help but think about, wow, if we were home, Kyle and I probably would have been standing there at that window. Who knows what the shards of glass would have done? And I don't know if that was anything serious, like God took us away knowing that we would be there in the window, but I do think about things like that. How many times have we missed the storm because of his grace? Yeah, I've seen storms. I hold on to them with with just an awe of who he is. But how many times have I not seen the storm because he removed me from that area, removed whatever that obstacle could have been, and yet we do face the storms, don't we? Well, I'm thankful that we can just hold on to that truth. And we're going to pray for the giving at this time as well. It's, it's, a, it's a privilege to give. And it's an honor to be able to give back to the Lord just a small portion of our blessing. So let's pray, shall we, as we give thanks for his goodness in all things, including the opportunity to tithe and give offerings. Lord, we're thankful that you do bless. We're thankful that we can give to you and just honor you with our finances. It is important those things help us to do projects. They help us to reach people. They help us put gas in tanks, which is difficult at this time. So we're thankful for the privilege it is to give and allow for your ministry to flourish. We're thankful for those that have given so wonderfully to our uh, ministries throughout this community, and we pray that they continue to grow because of the goodness of your people. We give thanks and praise and pray a blessing on each one that's able to give. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you want to give in person, the offering plates are here. Many of you choose to do it online. God bless you for that. Thank you for your faithfulness. And we, you can come as we do the next song. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. I've been held in your hands From the moment that I wake up Until I lay my head I will sing of the goodness of God All my life you have been faithful All my life you have been so, so good with every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. I love your voice. You have led me through the fire in darkest night. You are close like no other. I've known you as a father. I've known you as a friend, 
I have lived in the goodness of God. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down and surrendered, now I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down and surrendered, now I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. All my life I have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. Every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. I will sing of the goodness of God. How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished. The end is written, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Who could imagine so great a mercy? What heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross has spoken, I am forgiven. The King of kings calls me his own. Beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever. Jesus Christ, my
raise our hands to you, God. And we thank you for what you did. We ask, Lord, that you would pour out your spirit upon us, Lord. And that you would minister to us, Jesus. See, right now, in your hearts, take your, your biggest concern right now and just ask Jesus about it. Just lay it at his feet right now. Let's just worship him at the moment right now. Just be quiet before the Lord. Lord, we know that you're speaking to us, God. We pray, Lord, that as we lay these items at your feet, God, that you will take care of them, Lord, and according to your riches and your glory and how much you care for us, God. We pray, Lord, that we would minister to this community, that we would minister to people, Lord. We'd have your spirit just pour out upon us, God. Encourage everyone here today, God. And Lord, just identify what it is that you would want us to do, to share your word to everyone, God. We pray that now. Now, Lord, I just pray that you would be here for the rest of this service, that you would be with our speaker as he brings forth the word this morning, God. Bless everybody here, we pray. In your name, amen. All right, you guys may go ahead and be seated. At this time, it is a wonderful day to be at church, is it not? And just be able to be in his presence and worship him. And so we just want to make sure that we go through the, some of the bulletin here. Thank you. Uh, a big thank you to all the ladies who helped with the teacher's appreciation meal by providing cookies and bars. That's a blessing. So there, thank you ladies for that. Oh, and beginning today, starting today for the next two weeks, we are doing Krispy Kreme sales. You might see a table out there and some different things. If you like Krispy, I mean, how many people here like Krispy Kremes? I, I'm seeing a lot of hands right now. <laughs> We're going to be raising the money for the BGMC. You know, which Boys and Girls Missionary Challenge, where we're able to go and provide our missionaries with um, literature and different stuff to be able to minister around the world to communities that need that. That's where the, uh, that's going. They are, um, you can sign up with, a, with one of the kids there anytime here. Um, you'll have some of them, they'll come and they'll ask you, it's $12 per dozen there from the 14th to the 26th. All right, and they'll be delivered on the September 1st is when they'll be coming in. All right, so this Friday night, luau night over here at the Parsonage. Hey, all right. We're going to have fun, you know. I'm going to see if we can find some grass skirts, you know. I don't know, maybe some hula hoops or something. I don't know. But we're going to have some fun time with, with the, the seniors at that particular um, gathering. It'll be fun. Um, feel free. It's, at, it's next Friday at 530. Feel free to go right behind the church here and and um, we're going to try to keep everything down below here and make it easy and accessible to everybody for that. So that'll be great. Um, ladies road trip to Dickinson, Saturday, August 27th, 8 a.m. And you guys will be back around 2 o'clock. So what? Oh, 4 o'clock. 2, 4 o'clock, whatever the ladies decide, I guess, is when you want to get back there at the time. And so I guess there's no really no big hurry for you to get back. There is there. <laughs> so you guys are going to have fun doing some shopping in the fellowship and everything. It's, and that'll be a great time of fellowship. Outcast Youth begins Sunday, August 28th at 2.30 p.m. So it's going to be moved to the Sunday in the afternoons there. So youth, teenagers, let's uh, go there and have, be ministered to Okay, and if you know some teenagers, let them know about it. 
so that they can be there, all right? And Sunday school will begin on September 11th at 9 a.m. for that. So all ages be there for that. So, well, the time has come. I get to introduce the speaker this morning. I have, um, you know, known him most of my most of my life. I've known him, and so in that, um, I think so anyway. <laughs> eh. Anyway, he is um, my son, Nathan. He is coming from the intern, doing an intern with the youth over in Payette, Idaho for the summer. He's basically, literally, he's driving through here to Glendive um, because he's going to go back to Trinity Bible College here in Ellendale to start his junior year. He needs to be there by 5 o'clock this afternoon. That's probably not going to happen, but <laughs> that's, uh, especially when they're an hour ahead over there than we are here, so, but that'll be great and all that. So before I get too much further, I'd like to excuse the children to Children's Church there. So all the, the children, you can head on to over there. So at this time, I, you know, I, I'm going to have to have a bucket or something because I'm probably going to have tears, you know, and, and the water's going to hit the floor while he's speaking, you know. But anyway, but my, my son, Nate, if you want to come on up here and you want to minister, he's got a word for us, and um, do good, son. Thanks, Dad. I, I guess I'm here now. All right, well, I'm going to open us in prayer. All right, Father, thank you for allowing me to be here this morning to be able to preach at the pulpit here this morning. I thank you for allowing everybody to just get here safely this morning and just to allow everyone to be here in your presence, Lord. And I ask that as I go through this service and as I preach your word, Lord, that you just lead me and allow, allow myself to be led by your spirit, Lord, and that it would be your words and your message, not just what I want to say, but what you want to say to this congregation, Lord. I ask that you just be with me in your name. Amen. Wow. Wow. I am I'm so happy to be here. It's been, uh, I don't know, a little over a year now since I've spoken here, and it's just, it's just so exciting to be here, you know, just to see everybody's faces. Uh, for all of you that are new here, I've grown up in this church for most of my life. This is my home church. This is the church I claim when I say I'm, well, my home. So I'm just so excited to be here and to be able to share a message with you. Most, most of the time, usually when I come here, I give you guys a little bit of a life update, what's been going on in my life. So the past year, I went through my sophomore year at Trinity, and then I was the, uh, after after that year, I decided that I would do an internship, and I, it wasn't just an internship, but I was actually the youth pastor this summer at uh, Payette, of Idaho, Payette, Idaho, at the River of Life Christian Center, and it was just a great time being able to do that, and I'm going into my junior year. Uh, I know it doesn't look like it, but I am running cross country. I did it last year, but uh, I'll be doing that again. And then I'm also the, uh, I've been elected as the student body president at Trinity Bible College. So I'll be serving in that. But, uh, <laughs> well, we're, really, we're really in a clappy mood this morning. Is this a normal thing, Pastor Kevin? <laughs> Pastor Kevin's just up here getting applause every other minute. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. Well, I'm going to go ahead and open up my notes here a little bit. I mean, for you, Kevin, I'll try not to stay on them too much. <laughs> but, uh. There's so many Kevins in this church, you guys probably have no idea who I'm talking to. That's all right. <laughs> but, uh, all right, I want to share, share a little bit of, actually, sorry, I got a quote here. We got the presentation going? All right, we got the presentation going. Let's go ahead, uh, I'm going to open with this quote here if we want to go to the next slide. Oh, it's in the back there too, that's nice. Uh, we must realize that Jesus' ethical demands are what we strive for in this life, but also realize we do not reach perfection in this life either. We should not stop trying, but we should never think we have arrived. Now, uh, this is a, I took this from a slide in one of my classes at Trinity. It's a Theology 2. It's a, no, this is hermeneutics. Sorry, that's a different, uh, I skipped the, skipped the gun there. But um, I took this quote from a lecture, and I really liked it because I think, uh, I think this is what we should go into any message and go into any kind of study thinking about is how 
How do we become closer to Christ? How do we take Jesus' teaching and try to strive for them? But we must realize that we are humans. We will fail. We will not receive perfection in this lifetime. But all we can do is try to strive to become more like Jesus. So I ask that as you listen to my message here today, that you would just try to take something away from this message. And as you leave today, just strive to take Jesus' teaching and strive to become a little more like Christ today. So going on from that, I'm going to share a little bit something about me, Uh, a little bit of a personal thing, a little bit of a story about my life, something that I do at college. Um, I had the the object for this object analogy in my hand this morning, but as you see, there's no object. Uh, Basically, I walked out the door and didn't grab it, but that's okay. We're still here. I'm still going to tell the story. So at college, um, we have the campus, and you walk places as you do anywhere else. And oftentimes when I walk to class or I'll walk to the gym or I'll walk to practice or I'll walk to chapel, um, I don't really want to talk to people. I don't really want to see people oftentimes. Oftentimes I'm just like, I really just want to get there and I don't want to have to have a conversation. So I have my headphones. I'm supposed to have my headphones with me, but I don't. But what I do is I put these headphones on and I, put, I start listening to music. And as I'm listening to music, you know what that does for me? As soon as I put those headphones on, most people aren't going to talk to me. I can just walk past them. Sometimes I don't even put on music. Sometimes I really just don't want to talk to people. I really just want to put on these headphones and walk past, and I don't want anybody to say anything to me. Now, there's not necessarily anything wrong with wanting to just not have to interact with people. Some of us are introverts, some of us are extroverts. It's not necessarily wrong to need some time to yourself or to not necessarily want to talk to people. But the issue comes is when people wanting to talk to me, even though I have my headphones on, I'm now irritable. Like if somebody comes and taps on my shoulder and starts wanting to have a conversation with me, or I sit down at the lunch table uh, and then some people decide to come and sit by me, which usually happens. For some reason, people like me, so they want to sit by me. Um, but the problem is, is when I have my headphones on and people want to interact with me, and I'm generally just kind of irritated that people are trying to talk to me, and I enter this conversation, and I'm just already kind of like, oh, hey, what do you want? I- I'm already kind of in a bad mood. I don't enter this conversation with love. And oftentimes that can hurt people. When people come to you and they're excited to tell you something, when people come to you and they just want to talk to you, they just want someone to talk to, and you're not willing to talk to them, and I'm irritated with them that they're even just trying to talk to me, that can hurt them. And I don't enter those conversations and enter those scenarios in my life with love. Loving people is... I know it's kind of hard to say, but it's something that I have struggled with in the past. To want to actively wake up and actively go into my day-to-day life and to love others. For some people, that comes really easy. For others, it doesn't. For me, it didn't. A prayer I'd often pray is, God, please help me to love others more today. And I'm going to be talking about love today. And I... This is something that God's really just been working on in my life in the past year at college, is to love others more. So I'm going to be opening up to the first bit of scripture now. Uh, Well, I won't be opening it up. I'm going to read from my notes, and it'll be on the screen for you guys. Um, I'm going to be reading from the uh, the ESV version, but I do realize when I made this presentation, uh, I was going over it earlier today, um, I I did mess up. I think that's NIV up there. There's a version, but I'm reading from ESV, okay? So we're here. But um, 1 John 4, 7 through 12. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. All right, we're going to go through this and kind of just look at it, kind of just really 
really just take our time here. I'm going to read verses 7 and 8 real quick because we're going to go through sections here. Dear friends, let us love one another for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. All right, so what, what does this mean for us? Really, this means everything we do needs to have love in it. We need to have love ingrained in our being. We need to really just love and really know love. I, I want you to notice something here. It says, everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. So if we love, we've been born of God. We've, we've been born of God and we know God. And then it goes on to say, Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. What does this mean? If we don't know love, we don't know God. God is love, so we must know love in order to know God. Does that make sense? Okay, we're going to move on to the next scripture, verses 9 and 10. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. This is love. This is how God showed us love. What did he do? He sent his son, Jesus. He sent Jesus to die on the cross for our sins, to pay the price for our sins, to atone for us, for us. This is how God shows us love. Now, there's two things I want us to acknowledge here. The first thing is, there's nothing I can do, there's nothing I will do, have done, there's nothing I can do, there's nothing you can do, you will do, or anything anybody has done to deserve this. The only reason this happened is because God loves you and because God loves me. That is why this happened. That is why God sent his son to die on the cross to pay, pay the price for our sins. Now, the second thing I want you to acknowledge is that there's nothing I can do, nothing you can do, nothing anybody can do to change that. God still loves you regardless of what you do, regardless of anything we have done or will do, God still loves you. Now, I want to continue on to verse 11 now. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Wow, this is pretty difficult here. No, not really. This is, this is pretty straightforward. This is pretty straightforward. Someone help me out. What did God do to us? He loved us. He loved us. Okay, so, so this, is, this is going to be hard. This is going to be really difficult. So God loved us. So what should we do? Love others. Awesome. We got this. We're, we're on a roll today. Here we go. All right. Well, let's continue on to verse uh, 12 and 13 now. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. All right. I want to take a moment to look at this, uh, the first part of this. It says, no one has ever seen God. Why, why is that in this scripture Talk, this, this chunk of scripture that's talking about love. Okay, it's kind of out of place. It, it looks like it's out of place, but I tell you, there is a reason why this is here. It says, no one has ever seen God. What is, what is John talking about here? What is he talking about here? No one has ever physically seen God. I haven't physically seen God. I do not believe you guys have physically seen God. So no one's physically seen God, but if we continue to read, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. So God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. So let's look at this. Let's think about this. God is love. God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. So and the fact that it mentions that no one has seen God, it means that we're talking about seeing God. But how do we see God? I can see God in myself and in others in love. I can see God when I love, and I can see God in you when you love. Because God is love. And how, how, how has... Uh, and verse 13 talks about how he abides in, in us, and that is through his Holy Spirit. That's how he abides in us. Um, let me get caught up here. So I, I, I talked a little bit in the beginning in the, 
the quote was about Jesus' teaching. And one of the things I really enjoy about the Bible and I like about the Bible is that there's all this teaching and then God sent an example for us. God sent his son because he loved us, but it wasn't just to pay that price, but he also sent him as an example and as a teacher to us. So what we're going to do is we're going to go through uh, different parts of Jesus's life and just look at some of Jesus's teaching. So I'd like to start with Matthew chapter 5, verses 43 through 47. So verses 43 through 47 say, You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven, for he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brother, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? All right, so we're talking about loving our enemies. I, I, uh, to get myself back on track, and I don't, I don't know if it helps you, it helps me, but I always like to read the verses I'm specifically talking about again. So we're going to read verses 43 and 44. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Wow, okay. Okay, well, let's... Uh, that, that, that's not an easy thing to do. Let's uh, talk a little bit about what does it mean to love your enemies? So in order to know what it means to love your enemies, you first have to identify who is your enemy. All right, now don't be looking at your neighbor now, okay? <laughs> I'm just kidding. But, um, but uh, you have to figure out who, who is your enemy. W- what is your enemy? Who is your enemy? And when this was written, there was a lot of physical enemies all around them. It wasn't very difficult to find an enemy or have an idea of who your enemy is. And for some of us, that may not be that difficult. But for myself, I did find it a little bit difficult to like think who, who in my mind is actually my enemy. Um, and I mean, we could try to like, as American citizens, we could try to just like name like a physical enemy. Like, who are we at war with? Who have we been at war with? Who, who does our country not like? We could think about it like that, or we could try to think of a person that has hurt us, or it, it, you try to think of who is your enemy. And for me, I, I mean, I've, I, I struggle to actually come up with who is my enemy. Uh, and I was talking to a friend about this, and he shared with me what he thought would be a good example of an enemy or something, a way to think about this is who do you, who, who do you believe doesn't deserve to be loved? Who do you think in your mind doesn't deserve to be loved? You can think of that as your enemy. Um, and it says here, but I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. That's not always an easy thing to do. People hurt us. People cause us pain. Regardless of what they do to us, we still have to love them. <laughs> and I'm like, God, you don't just want us to love them, but you also want me to think about them and pray for them? It wasn't loving enough. Can't I just say I love them? But no, I have to pray for them. Pray for your enemies and love them. I'm going to go on to verse 45 here. So that you may be sons of your father who is in heaven, for he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. Wow. Wow. Okay. Well, if we look back at 1 John, if we look back at 1 John here, it says in 1 John 4, 7, everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. And it talks more about Whoever does not love does not know God, and God is love. So we must love in order to know God. In order to know God, we must know love because God is love. And what is this saying here in Jesus' teaching? So that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. What does it say before that? I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Why? Why must we do this? so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. As Christians, we must love 
We must love to know God. We must love even our enemies so that we may be sons of our Father who is in heaven. All right, I'm going to move on to verse 46 and 47 here. In 46 it says, For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? I mean, it's pretty easy to love those that love you. It's pretty easy to reciprocate. Am I saying that word right? Reciprocate. (laughs) I got the head nod from Tina, so that that means I'm good. Okay. (laughs) Reciprocate those feelings that people send to us. When people are nice to us, it's really easy to be nice back to them. But it's not very easy when people don't love us and people don't show us love to love them back. It's even harder when we love them and they hurt us in return. Now, I want to talk a little bit about what it means to be a minister to me. Talk a little bit about ministry. I mean, Pastor Kevin, Tina, my dad, my mom, anybody that's ever been involved in ministry, probably most of you can relate to this somehow, but anybody that's ever been a minister can relate to this. To be a minister to me doesn't just mean speaking up here. Some people might think that all you do is speak on a Sunday and then you go home and kind of just hang out for the week and kind of prepare a message, but there's a lot more to that. There's a lot more than just that to being a minister. What it means is you have to love other people. And I don't mean just like saying, I love you, but I mean when someone's hurting, you're there for them. You're there when they're struggling. You're there, and you're there when no one else is there, and you're showing them love continually, and you walk alongside them, and you encourage them in their walk with Christ. Now, that's not necessarily the hard part. It's, it's not necessarily difficult to encourage people and to walk alongside them, but what's really hard is when you do all this in you're walking alongside them and you're encouraged and you're invested in them and you're showing them love and they decide to turn away from Christ. And sometimes they don't just turn away from Christ, but they turn away from Christ and they turn away from you and they hurt you and they push you away. You handed them your heart, you loved them and they took your heart and even though all you showed them was love, they crush it. You want to know what's even harder than that about being a minister? The really difficult part is after they crush your heart, you have to wake up the next day and choose to love again and choose to hand your heart to someone else again and choose to love someone else and go through the process again just hoping that they won't hurt you again, that they won't hurt you. You have to hand your heart to someone Now, I want you to notice that I kept saying minister. This is what it means to be a minister to me. I don't actually think, I don't actually think that's what it means to be a minister. I think that's what we're supposed to do when we decide to follow Christ. As soon as you decide to give your life to Christ and decide to follow him, you are meant to love people. You're meant to love them regardless. And you are opening up yourself to being hurt by others. And you still need to choose to love even after you've been hurt. Sorry. I want to talk a little bit about how the world views Christians in today's world. Um... Not everybody has a good view of the church. Actually, a lot of people don't have a good view of the church or a good view of Christians. A lot of people that are in this world have been hurt by the church, or if they haven't been hurt, they've heard about being hurt by the church. And when people mention Christians or they mention the church, people think of hate or judgment, or they'll think that we think we are better than them. And in some cases... That is how the church is. Now, I'm a part of three different congregations right now. I have the congregation I go to at Ellendale. I have my home congregation here. And then I have the church. I guess I'm not a part of the, I mean, I, I still kind of am. Like, I mean, I invested there, and I went there for a few months, and I became a part of the family. Um, and I don't necessarily believe that any of the congregations are like that. I don't necessarily believe that it's, it's me or it's you or it's your neighbor that is causing these people to believe these things. 
But the point still stands that there are people in this world that view the church as a plate of hate and a place of judgment, and they don't feel like they can walk in these doors. They don't feel like they can come to Christians, and they see Christ not as a loving God, and they see Christians not as loving people. The point still stands that people view the church and Christian Christians this way. Not all people, but a lot of people do. And even though it may not be us, it's still our job as followers of Christ to spread the gospel to them. It's still up to us to share with them, even though they view us this way, that God is a loving God and so are we. And I can tell you what, if we enter these conversations and we enter, uh, we talk to people and we don't show love, it's really not going to do any good if we just confirm the beliefs they already have. I want to talk a little bit about something one of my professors at college shared with me. This was, this was the one that was in Theo 2. I jumped the gun earlier. This is, uh, the, the lecture was Theology 2. It was a course about sin. It was a course about sinning, the theology of, of sin. Basically, everything about sin. A wonderful course. I really enjoyed it. I mean, I'm just kidding. Well, it, it was good to learn, but it was kind of a heavy course. But one day, he asked us a question. He told us, what was the last thing you sinned? What was your last sin? And the whole class was thinking, trying to come up with what was the last sin. For some of us, it was really easy. But for others, we had to actually, for others, they had to actually think. And my professor here, he had to think a little bit. He had to go back a couple days. And he was thinking about this time he went to a concert. He went to one of his kids' concerts. And at this concert, he, uh, he noticed that someone was sitting near him not too far from him. He saw that this person was sitting near him and he knew things about her. Because of his uh, role in the community and because of his role in the church, he knew that she had done sinful actions. She, he knew that she had committed adultery on a normal basis. He knew these things about her and he started to think in his mind, oh, I don't really, I don't really want to be seen sitting near her. I, I don't really want to be... A, I don't really want to talk to her. And, and he, he felt very convicted about this. He had been, he knew that that was sinful to think that those ways. And um, th that's all I'm really going to share about my professor is he was sharing that, this thing that went through him. And really the point of me sharing this is there's going to be these people in our community that are living sinful lives, that are not living the standards of Christians, and I want to say that that's okay, that we, we can't put our judgment on them before they decide to follow Christ, but what we can do is we can show them love. We can show them love, and we can encourage them. You really shouldn't expect them to follow our beliefs and our standards if they haven't given their life to Christ, because why would they? They're not Christians, so they don't, they're not held to this standard that we hold ourselves to. But what we can do is love them, and hopefully through that love, they will grow to know Christ. They will grow to know God, because God is love. Now, there is actually a story in the Bible I want to share with you that's a little bit like this. This is called the story of the prodigal son. Now, I'm not going to read the entire story because, well, we'd be here a while. Um, <laughs> And I got to get back to Trinity by five, apparently. That's not going to happen. But um, I, I'm going to summarize the prodigal son for you guys a little bit. And we're going to be focusing on the second son. But in order to understand the second son, we must understand the first son. So there was two sons and one father. The younger son came to the father, and he asked the father for his inheritance. And just, just to let you understand something about in the, the culture... In Jewish culture, if you were to ask this, this would almost be as if you were saying, I wish you were dead to your father. So this is a massive insult because in order to get your inheritance, your father would die, then you would receive your inheritance. But the son is asking the father for this inheritance while he's still alive. So this is a major insult to his father. So the father, regardless of the insult, still gives his son the inheritance. And then the son goes out and spends it, we'll just say reckless living. We could get into details, but that's not really the point. He spends all the money recklessly living, 
okay? And then he ends up in a bad situation where he's working for a pig farmer. And he is starving, and he realizes that the servants that work for his father are living a better life than he is. And he comes to the decision one day that he is going to go back to his father, not as a son, but he is going to beg his father to take him back as a servant. So one day he actually goes back to the father, and the father was waiting for him. And when he arrived, the father embraced him and celebrated. He told his servants to bring him robes, to bring him rings, to bring him uh, to kill the fattened calf. And they threw a massive celebration to celebrate the fact that his son had came back. Now, while this was all going on, the second son, this is the son that I want to focus on today, because there's kind of two, two lessons in this, these stories. The second son is out in the field working. And when a servant comes by, he asks the servant what is going on, and the servant tells him all this. And he's upset. He is not happy. He doesn't go into the father's celebration. Another thing I want you to know about the that in this culture is to not go to your father's event, to not go to their celebration is also a pretty big insult because people take note when your son doesn't even bother to show up to your event. He didn't even bother to show up to this party you threw. So that's a big insult in itself to the fact that the second son didn't come into the father. But regardless of that, the father still goes out to the son and talks to the son. And the... The son tells the father, I'm, the, the son was upset. And he tells him, I've been here all along. I've been working for you all along, and yet you haven't given me anything. My brother spent all his inheritance on reckless living. And I've been here working for you all along, and you haven't given anything. The father tells the son that pr- pretty much everything that is mine is already yours. But but where I really want to focus here in verse 32, it was fitting to celebrate and be glad for this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. It was fitting to celebrate. Now, we we may not all be like the second son. And when people walk in, they may not go up to them and like openly put them down and be like, oh, this is ridiculous. But in our minds, just as my professor had, he had already formed judgment in his mind, had already decided in his mind, I don't wish, I don't want to be seen near them. I don't want to be seen around them. I don't want to be associated with them. But that's not what we're called to do. We're called to love them. We are called to walk alongside them, to encourage them. And if by chance they do walk into this church, we need to celebrate. We need to welcome them and be excited that they are here. Come to them and welcome them in the church and welcome them back. Or welcome them here for the first time, one or the other. It doesn't matter. We still need to welcome them and celebrate that they have came and they are seeking God. Now, I want to I wanna jump over to John chapter 13, verses 14 through 17. If I, then your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things... Blessed are you if you do them. Okay, well, I want to first look at verses verses 16 here. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Okay. Let's, Let's talk about what this is saying here. Jesus has just washed the disciples' feet. Our Lord and Savior, their Lord and Savior, the Son of God, washed their feet. He didn't care if he was seen doing a task that usually a lowly servant would do. And 
And I, I think about this when I read this and I, and I really start to think about this. If my Lord and Savior is willing to do that, the lowly task of a servant, and to be seen doing that in front of his friends, not even just people he doesn't know. This isn't just random people. A lot of times it's kind of easy to be like, oh, I can do that. I'm never going to see these people again. This is just a random Walmart, right? Um, but it's easy to do that. But he did that in front of his 12 disciples, his closest friends, the people he knew. He was willing to get on his knees and wash the disciples' feet. And if my Lord and Savior, if my Lord and Savior is willing to do this, what should I be willing to do? What should we be willing to do? Should we care about who we're seen with? Well, we might, we should probably care about what we're seen doing with them, but I mean, we shouldn't, I'm not saying we should go sin with them, but should we care what they have done or should we be with them, encourage them, and love them? And now I want to look at verses 14 and 15. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. All right, there's, there's two things I want us to kind of look at in this verse. Uh, the first is just the act of love that even the master is willing to do for his servants. The fact that Jesus is willing to do this, that act of love. The second thing I want to really look at and kind of get into is the command in verse 15. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. This is something I, I really like about the Bible. Oftentimes what happens is God or Jesus, they don't just tell us to do something but they show us, they give us an example. For earlier on it says, in verse 11, 1 John 4, verse 11, it says, Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. God first showed us love. He showed us how to love. He sent Jesus, that was God showing us love. So he showed us an example, that means we need to do it because then he goes on and says, we also ought to love one another. And then it's the same here in verse 15, for I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. Jesus has shown us, now we should do. He has been our example, now we should do. You know, something I we always need to remember is it's, it's really not about us. I don't have it written up here, but um, can somebody tell me what's the, what's the greatest commandment? It's, uh, it's to love God with all your heart, right? So love God with all your heart. What's, the, what's after that? To love your neighbor. God, where, where's the verse about uh, loving myself? <laughs> where's that at? I'm not, saying, I'm not saying you shouldn't love yourself, but it's not about us. It's about loving God and loving others. To serve regardless, to love regardless. I really do believe that there is no aspect in life, no scenario in life that we shouldn't enter with love. Regardless if we've been hurt, regardless of anything, we should enter every conversation, every scenario in our life with love. Now to finish, uh, finish up a little bit, I wanna talk a little bit about a experience I had this summer. I was at youth camp. I was at the Idaho camps this summer, and uh, we had an altar call. It was at the end of service, and the speaker had told all of the youth pastors and all of the leaders that came with the youth groups to come forward and stand all across the front of the altar here. 
And we, we came and stood all across. And then while we were getting, going up there, he told the students who had just been, they were handing out a piece of paper and a pen to every student. And they were instructed to write whatever they felt shameful of, whatever they were struggling with, any shame that they felt or anything they struggled with, write on that piece of paper if, if you want to. And um, when you, then they, they instructed them, when you are done writing whatever you feel shameful about or struggle with, to bring that piece of paper up and give it to one of the leaders. Uh, and then as leaders, we were instructed to, when we received that piece of paper, they told us, read that piece of paper, and then you will throw the piece of paper away. So I would read the piece of paper, then I'd put it in my pocket to later throw away. And after you read this thing, we were instructed to give them a hug and tell them, Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. Regardless of what's on that paper, Jesus loves you. Now, there's two parts of this you need to look at. There's one, the part of the, the student and then there's two, the part of the leader. The first part is they're coming forward and they're presenting this thing they feel shameful about, this thing they struggle with, and they need to know, and you need to know that regardless of what that is, Jesus still loves you. Now the second part is as the leader accepting the paper I already decided in my heart before anybody brought me a piece of paper that regardless of what was written on that paper, regardless of what this person has done, I'm still going to show them love. I'm still going to tell them that Jesus loves them. And I really believe that that's what we need to do as Christians all the time. Regardless of how people treat us, regardless of if people have hurt us in the past, regardless of what's going on, we need to show them love. So I challenge you as you go into this week, as you go into your day-to-day -day life, think about the areas of your life that you aren't loving well in and give them over to God. If, you, if there's any parts of your life that you feel you aren't loving people properly, Ask God to help you love. All right, I'll uh, close and, pr well, I think I'm passing over to Pastor Kevin. Uh, so I'll, I'll pray first, I'll pray first. Um, God, thank you for today. Thank you for allowing us to be here. And I ask that you help myself and you help every member of this congregation, just everybody that came here this morning. You just help us to love others and to love people how you want us to, Lord. Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much, Nathan. It won't be long and he will be given that title, I suppose, in an official capacity, Pastor Nathan. And we look forward to hearing how God continues to guide you in your life and your ministry. Uh, before we close the service completely, just to give you a heads up, uh, I would like for us as people, uh, family, to give a love offering. And if you are able to do that today, uh, you know we'll have an offering plate brought up here and we can just do it like we normally do with every offering now. Or you can go online and, and actually designate and we can use that and then we'll We'll give it some time to allow for, for any funds that you are wanting to give for Nathan because, honestly, college is very expensive. Uh, I was excited to hear about a scholarship that he told me about that he was able to qualify for. Uh, but even with scholarships, there's a lot of expenses. And so if you are able to give, uh, please do that today or go online and do it at some time this week. And we'll get some things together and send it to him. But I want to close with a prayer, but before I do that, imagine this visual. Uh, Nathan gave us a great visual about what he struggled with in the beginning of his message. 
when it came to that moment or that time of his day where he didn't want to talk to anybody, he put the, the headphones on. And because the headphones are on, people just automatically just, they normally just don't approach you. They just assume you're busy, that you're listening to music, you're listening to a podcast, whatever it is. In order for that first step to take place for him to be accessible to loving people, it's a physical move of removing the headphones. How many of us put the headphones on every day? You are focused on you, your agenda, the mission that you are on for yourself. Whether it's going to runnings to pick some supplies up, getting some groceries, filling the gas tank, sitting down to have a nice meal. What is it that you're doing in your day and everybody sees the headphones? You're not accessible. You've turned it off. You're about you. You're not about loving. I think we all do it. And then when someone actually talks to you, are you annoyed? Like, really? Didn't you see my face? I don't want to be disturbed. Or are you responding and living your life like Jesus did? Man, what, it was a great word, great challenge about love. Well, let me tell you, if you haven't figured it out, love is not words. Love is action. You can say loving things. You can say the word I love. People don't believe you until they see it in action. And so I encourage you, take the headphones off and actively love people. Amen? Would you stand with me as we close? And after we close, if you're able to give an offering, that'd be awesome. As a love offering, just to help with some of those schooling expenses. Lord God, thank you for your goodness. Thank you for the challenge about loving. And I just pray your blessing to be upon each and every one who's able to hear this word and to apply it to our daily living. That we would all be ministers of your gospel, regardless of the reception, to truly love others. Take the headphones off, the distraction, the I'm not wanting to be disturbed face. Let us look to people and look for opportunities of loving. Lord, we're also thankful for the privilege to give to be able to love someone through the financial portion of loving. And so I just pray a blessing on everyone who's able to give and may it go towards the furtherance of your kingdom through the schooling expenses that Nathan does incur. We're excited to hear about what is happening in his future and we're glad to be a part of it. We just give you thanks and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you as you go and we're having a plate brought up here real quick. If you would like to give and just